Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Varsity Tutor Star Course series, where today we're going to get the buzz on one of our ecosystem's most vital pollinators, the bee. We have the pleasure of being rejoined today by our friends at the Butterfly Pavilion, where your expert instructor, Kalei Thomas, will be telling us all about these wonderful winged creatures. Now, before we get started, I want to make sure that we are comfortable with the ecosystem of our classroom. So, in your live learning platform, you'll see a chat panel on the right-hand side of your screen. Feel free to use that chat panel to ask any questions that you have throughout the lesson and to answer the questions that Kalei will have for you as well. And if we don't get to your questions immediately, not to worry, we're gonna have about 10 minutes at the very end of the lesson for Q&A. Now, you'll also wanna make sure that you have your cameras close by because we're gonna have the opportunity toward the end of today's lesson to lean into the screen and pose for a selfie. And if you tag Butterfly Pavilion and Varsity Tutors on Instagram, you'll be entered to win a children's coloring book as well as an enrollment to wildlife creature camp. Now I'll talk more about that prize and how to enter toward the end of today's lesson, but for now I'm gonna go ahead and hand things off to your expert instructor, Kelly Thomas. Hi everyone, thank you so much for the introduction, Haley. It's so exciting to be with you all today. Uh, as Haley said, my name is Kel Lay. I'm gonna be your educator today from Butterfly Pavilion in Westminster, Colorado. So it's so good to be able to join all of you. We are gonna have a great time today learning about a very special pollinator and all kinds of different ways um, that they help us out. So we're gonna have a good time with that. Now I do wanna bring up though, we're called Butterfly Pavilion, right? And we do like to show off a lot more than just butterflies. If you join me for my other program, we talked a little bit about butterflies. But you might also remember that we like to show off a lot of different kinds of animals. One way we can remember those animals is actually by giving me a big thumbs up right now and then taking your thumb and running it down the middle of your neck or down your back, feeling your bumpy, maybe kind of pokey spine, right? Your backbone. Now, butterflies, bees, some of the other animals we have like tarantulas and sea stars and an octopus, all of those animals don't have a backbone. So Butterfly Pavilion, even though we do talk about butterflies, we also like to talk about a lot of different animals and all of those animals are known as invertebrates. So we are an invertebrate zoo, which means that we can talk about butterflies and like we're gonna talk about today, um, some different kinds of bees and lots of different animals. So important to keep that in mind today as we are talking about um, definitely one of the most important invertebrates in a lot of people's opinion, um, the bee, right? So today we are going to discover hopefully a few things about bees. I want us to learn a little bit about just generally what scientists know about them. I want us to figure out maybe why we should care about bees. And then towards the end, we're gonna learn a little bit about what we can do to help bees. So that, even though it seems like a short list, that's actually a lot of stuff to cover today. So we are gonna go ahead and start thinking about it. But I want to kind of know what you think of when you hear the word bee, right? Go ahead and close your eyes for a moment and picture what you think a bee looks like. I'll give you a couple seconds to do that. While you're picturing that bee, um, maybe you're imagining it to be kind of small, right? Maybe it has some colors like black or yellow or orange, and it might look kind of like this guy. This is a type of honeybee. And it's probably the most common bee, um, especially in the United States, that we're going to think about. So they have about seven different species that live here. And these are definitely the ones that we like to show off at Butterfly Pavilion. Um, in fact, in one of our exhibits right next to one of our famous tarantulas, we have a whole little hive that people can come visit. And they look just like this. This is what it would look like just to walk right up next to them. They even have a little tube to the outside that connects their hive to all of the beautiful gardens that we have on site so they can go out and look for flowers. Um, and that's pretty much what people think of when they imagine a bee. They're thinking of these honeybees. But there are a lot of other bees in the world as well. So we have about seven species of honeybees in um, the whole world. We might also think about bumblebees. So we have over 250 species of those. These are the kind of bees, if you've seen them in your garden, they're kind of bigger and fluffy. 
Um, we might see them um, occasionally throughout um, our gardens and parks. But there's actually an even bigger group of bees that we don't often think about, uh, which are known as solitary bees. And in the entire world, there's over 5,000 species of solitary bees. So oh, there's a lot more out there than just the honeybees we might originally imagine. Even with the solitary bee, that picture there, you can see it's kind of shiny and green. So they have a lot of different ways to look instead of just these standard um, kind of black and yellow that we might imagine when we picture a honeybee or a bumblebee. So we're gonna get to know these three different groups today and kind of understand them a little bit better. We're actually going to think about three different categories for all of these different bees so we can get to know them a little better. We'll start with our honeybees because something that a lot of people don't know about honeybees is that they're actually not native to the United States. So what that means is a long time ago, you could only find bees, honeybees in Europe where they really helped farmers pollinate crops. They were really useful. So when people started moving over to the United States, they actually brought honeybees with them to help with our crops here. So they were originally from somewhere else and brought to the United States in about the 1600s. Now, this doesn't mean that if you see a honeybee in your garden today, that it flew all the way from Europe or was brought here all the way from Europe. If you see a honeybee in the United States today, it was probably born here. It's probably been here its whole life. Um, but the idea that it's a non-native species just means that originally, a long time ago, it came from somewhere else to be here. So that's our first category. We're going to think about whether these bees are native or non-native. For our honeybees, we're also going to think about whether they are social or non-social. And social just means that they like to live in large groups or communities together. How many of you feel like you like to live with a lot of people or you like to be a lot of, around a lot of friends? Yeah, that means you might be kind of social like a honeybee. Um, honeybees definitely like to live in large groups. We saw a little bit earlier with Butterfly Pavilion's Hive, just how many bees there are all together. And sometimes honeybees can live in hives of up to 10,000 or 60,000 bees. So maybe if you felt a little social, you're not quite as social as a honeybee, right? How many of you feel like you could hang out with 10,000 other people? I don't know, maybe not quite as social as a honeybee. But definitely they're pretty good at living in those large groups and colonies. Um, it kind of helps because if you have all of those um, bees around, you can divide up some of your chores, right? That might be the benefit of it. You know, instead of you having to do the dishes and the take out the trash and clean up after the dog or something, right? The honeybees, they kind of organize it together. So some of them will go out and look for food. Some will stay and take care of the babies. Some will defend the hive from wasps or things that are trying to attack it. So it's a pretty good system for them. Now, one last kind of category we're going to think about today for these different groups of bees is what kind of pollinators they are. So honeybees are generalist pollinators. This means that they're going to be feeding on nectar or pollen from many different kinds of flowers. So think for a moment about whether you are a picky eater or not. Do you like to eat anything that's put in front of you? What do you think? Yeah, if you're a picky eater, then you're gonna be a little bit different from our honeybees. Honeybees like to eat any kind of nectar or pollen they can find. So they'll visit lots of different kinds of flowers. They are not only gonna to go to small purple flowers or something like that. They will go all over the place for their food. So if we look at it all together there, that means that our honeybees are non-native, they are social, and they are generalist pollinators. If we compare this to bumblebees, well, we're gonna find that there are actually a few native species of bumblebees. So across the United States, there might be about 45 different bumblebees we can run into. In Colorado, we might see the Western bumblebee or the half black bumblebee. Think about where you're from and see if you can spot a bumblebee on this map that you might get to see in your parks or gardens or schools. I really like the rusty patch bumblebee. He's got that orange stripe across his back. 
And like I said, there are about 45 different species across the United States. So it does kind of help that um, there are going to be a lot of them for us to see. Even if you don't see one on this map, um, there might be others that are going to be in your area. So they have always been in the United States. They weren't brought here from another continent like the honeybees, and they're ones that you're going to see a lot of. Now, part of the benefit of having a native species of bee, like the bumblebees, has a lot to do with what we're seeing here, flowers blooming. Flowers don't just bloom at one time of year. There are some flowers that bloom in the spring. There are some that bloom in the summer, some that bloom all the way in the fall. And so part of the benefit of having a native species of bumblebee is that these bumblebees have always grown up and always evolved alongside some of these flowers. So they are some of the first bees to come out in the spring because they know when some of the first flowers will come out. And they're going to be some of the last bees to go into hibernation in the fall because they're going to be staying active until the very last flowers start blooming or stop blooming. So they're going to be out for quite a while throughout all this time. Now, honeybees have been here for a long time, um, just not quite as long as the bumblebees. So even though they might get some of these flowers, they might miss some of the earliest in the spring and some of the latest in the fall. Native species are going to be really good at figuring out all of those different flowers. Just like honeybees, bumblebees are going to be a little bit social, um, but a lot of you might relate to them a little bit more. They only are going to live in groups of 200 to 300 other bees. Maybe like some of your schools have a couple hundred students in them, right? So this is a little bit more reasonable. Um, definitely still benefits. They can split up some of the tasks, um, take care of the babies, go find food, all of those different things that they still need to get done, um, but they don't have to deal with quite as many other individuals. So we can kind of see there's already some similarities with our honeybees. And one of the last similarities that they'll have is that they are gonna be generalist pollinators, just like our honeybees were. So they will eat all kinds of different flowers. Part of the reason they are really good at pollinating and visiting different flowers has a lot to do with the type of pollination that they do. So what you're seeing here is a bee, bumblebee, really vibrating and shaking the flower here. And this is called buzz pollination. So the bumblebees will really quickly vibrate the flower to try to shake all of the pollen out of it. And all of that pollen will get on their furry bodies and be really easily transferred. So they are doing this to lots of different types of flowers, meaning they are gonna be generalist pollinators, just like our honeybees. And then our last group, and probably the ones we know the least about or just don't recognize quite as well, are gonna be our solitary bees. So these are bees that have, um, are gonna be native bees. They're a little different than honeybees in that way, but there are actually about 4,000 different species of them in the United States alone. So if you don't see your area represented on this map, there's a good chance there are at least a few different solitary bees that you can find in your area. One of my favorites here is the sweet bee because it's beautiful and blue. I wonder um, which one is your favorite solitary bee that you see up on this map here? I think I see some people agreeing that the sweet bee is really cool because it's blue, it's very beautiful. I always like, I see some others like the friendly flower lover, right? Its name is kind of fun. Uh, I would love to hang out with a friendly flower lover. But yeah, all of these are different types of solitary bees and maybe some things that are a little different than what we expect a bee to look like, um, but still, um, related to and does similar things to some of our honeybees and other bees that we expect to be bees. Now, as their name suggests, solitary bees are going to be solitary. They are not social. They live all alone. How many of you feel like this fits you a little bit more? Maybe you weren't very social, but you'd rather be 
um, by yourself some nights, maybe reading a book or something, you know, keep to yourself a little bit. I can understand that. Um, but solitary bees are definitely going to be like that. They don't have a big hive to go home to. Um, part of this is kind of hard, right? It means they have to take care of a lot of different things by themselves. They have to find a shelter. They have to protect their shelter by themselves. They have to find their own food, right? They don't rely on a lot of other bees to help them out with those things. So that's very important to think about for these solitary bees um, and some of what they do. And then the other way they're going to be a little different is these are going to be specialist pollinators. So instead of going to lots of different flowers, these are going to be our picky eaters, right? If you said you were a picky eater, you're probably a little bit more like a solitary bee. So they are going to go to one or a few different types of flowers. Um, but they're going to be very picky about it. So that's why some of them have certain names because they do have special relationships with certain plants. So the southern blueberry bee only goes to blueberry flowers. Same as the squash bee, it's only going to go to different kinds of squash like pumpkins or butternut squash or acorn squash. And a lot of the wildflowers that we see in our mountains or plains and native areas um, are actually going to be pollinated thanks to certain solitary bees that have special relationships with them. So it's really handy if you are a solitary bee because you are always going to the same type of flower. So you're always transferring the same type of pollen between those. We'll maybe see why that's a little important in just a bit. But as you can see them all kind of compared here, those are gonna be our three groups. We have a few types that are gonna be native, right? The bumblebees, the solitary bees, we have a few that are going to be social and generalist, those honeybees and the bumblebees. And then our solitary bees are going to be a little bit distinct in that they are solitary specialist pollinators. So that's kind of a lot of information, right? There's all these different kinds of bees. And some of you may be realizing there's a lot more bees than you ever even knew about, right? And so that makes me want to ask all of you, why are bees important? Why would we even bother talking about them today, right? They're kind of fun to look at, but is there anything else that we could really learn from them or get to know about them? Thank you for taking some time to get in your answers. <laughs> I see some of you are definitely saying that bees give us honey. Absolutely. Honey bees, it's in their name, right? They make honey. Um, sometimes they make way too much honey. And that's when people um, like beekeepers will harvest it and sell it sometimes, but we definitely get a food source from them. Some of you are saying that they are pollinators. I'm seeing that a lot, right? They transfer pollen or they um, are pollinators or they help pollination, right? There's lots of different ways people can say it, but it's clearly a very important thing to bees, right? Pollination is a very important process to flowers, right? And what it means is just that pollen moves from one flower to another of the same type, so that way the plant can produce a seed. So that's kind of a big definition there, but the idea is that we are um, making plants reproduce and produce seeds so we can have even more plants, right? And the thing I like to think about here, a lot of times we think that if a plant doesn't get pollinated, that it's going to die, right? And that's not always true. There are some plants that if they don't get pollinated, they'll die right after, but there are a lot of plants that continue to live. The big problem with not getting pollinated is that they can't produce a seed. They can't produce more plants. And that's what plants want to do. They want to produce more of themselves. So they definitely really want to be pollinated so they can produce a seed, but they might not necessarily die because they're not pollinated. And one of the best ways to get pollinated is to get the help of a pollinator, an animal that collects or transfers pollen between flowers. And you can see here, bees are some of the most important and numerous pollinators in the world, but there are other pollinators as well, particularly other insects like flies, beetles, butterflies, and moths, and even some things that aren't insects. 
Animals like bats or sometimes even dogs and cats and humans can be pollinators, uh, but they make up a very small portion of the pollinators in the world. Definitely the biggest group is going to be our bees, and they are some of the best pollinators. Honeybees, you might have seen some of those pictures with little orange baskets on their legs. They'll collect the pollen in those baskets on their legs and transfer them between flowers. Bumblebees, they do that buzz pollination to get all of the pollen out of the flowers and transfer it between them. And even solitary bees, because they go to the same type of flower, they reduce the chance that they mix up pollen in different flowers like the honeybees and bumblebees do. So they have a really good method of helping pollinate as well, which means that bees are some of the best pollinators out there. And it's really important that our plants get pollinated, um, not just because we wanna produce more plants, but often when a plant produces a seed, they produce something really tasty around the seed, right? That's how we get our fruits. Um, and when we produce more plants, we can produce more vegetables. So these are very important to us, of course. We love a lot of different fruits and vegetables and other animals enjoy those as well. So we definitely want bees to be able to help these plants get pollinated so we can get these fruits and vegetables from our plants. And honeybees are one of the best in particular, just because there are so many of them. They're so good at pollinating. They're also really easy to keep on a farm. So just like we keep cows and chickens and pigs on farms, we can keep bee farms as well. And bee farms are so helpful because if you keep them next to your um, farm for potatoes or um, strawberries or anything like that, they can help pollinate those plants and help them grow even better and produce more plants, right? So it's really easy to have them around. And the other convenient thing is they can easily fit in these boxes where they like to live in their hives. We can pack those up on trucks and actually move them around the country. So the same group of bees can be pollinating crops all over the place. There are actually pollination routes that move these bees across the United States. So the same group of bees might be pollinating sunflowers and apples and cherries in California, and then they might get moved up north to help um, pollinate uh, cranberries and pears and things up there. So there are a lot of different areas for them to go. And this does mean that we can thank a bee the next time we eat any of these items. <coughs> Pardon. So as you're looking here, there are a few different fruits. Some of my favorites are listed here. I wonder if you can find any favorite fruits or vegetables, something that you really like to cook with or just eat as a snack. Some of my favorite fruits here, there's pomegranates. I use onions all the time in my dinners and things like that. How many of you can't find anything on this list though? Yeah, some of you might be thinking, I don't really like any of that. I'm one of those picky eaters, right? Well, what about on this list? All of these things here are things that help or are helped pollinated by animals like bees. <coughs> so you can thank a bee the next time you see um, even weird things like hazelnuts. There's different kinds of nuts on here, chestnuts. Brazil nuts, right? What else is on here? There's coffee. Um, some of your parents sitting here might think that coffee is one of the best things on here. That's helped by animals like bees or pollinators. What else? There's different oils on here. That one's always kind of funny, right? If we have sunflower oil, well, bees had to help the sunflowers produce, so they help things like sunflower oil that's made from sunflowers which means there's a lot of other food products that are helped by bees besides just um, fruits and vegetables, right? If we think about this plant and the solitary bee that have a very special relationship, this is the alfalfa plant and it's pollinated by the alfalfa leaf cutter bee. And the reason this plant is so important is because it's actually food for animals like cows, right? So dairy cows and beef cows, which means that if bees are helping produce the food for these animals, then bees are indirectly helping us get things like cheese and milk and meat, right? So we can even thank a bee for those things as well. And 
we can even link a bee for our clothes. If you check the tag on your clothes today, if it's made of cotton, that's thanks to a bee as well. So all kinds of blankets and pillowcases and um, any kind of clothes you wear, coats, jackets, mittens, anything like that, if they're made of cotton, then we can thank a bee for them as well. And part of why we bring this up is because um, often we hear about things that are happening to bees, right? We can see that they're really important, but I wonder if there are some things that are happening to them as well. So let's go ahead and look at this experiment that we did at Butterfly Pavilion. We were trying to figure out what has been happening to the bees in Colorado here. So we, over the course of many years, went out to count how many bees we saw outside at Butterfly Pavilion. So we started in 2005, and this is an overhead map of Butterfly Pavilion, and everywhere you see a little white circle as an area where we spotted a bee on this day in 2005. <coughs> so I want everyone to take a moment and count how many bees you found in 2005. As soon as you get your number, go ahead and put it in the chat for me. I see a lot of numbers coming in. I'm seeing like 25s and 26s, uh, maybe some like 24s, so kind of in that range, maybe 24 all the way up to 27. So we definitely have some there. Um, I'll say about 25 or so. Then we went out five years later and we did this little experiment again. So in 2005, we did the same thing. We went out to count how many bees we saw at Butterfly Pavilion. So go ahead, count one more time. Well, this will be our second time. We'll do it one more time, but count again. How many bees did we see in 2010? All right, I see some saying 17. We have some friends who are saying 18, maybe up to 20, but kind of around there. So we'll say between like 17 and 20 or so, around 18. And then we did this one more time five years later in 2015. So how many bees did we see in 2015? All right, I see 10 a lot, maybe some nines, awesome. So yeah, around there, if we put all of that together in a chart, in 2005, we saw about 25 bees. In 2010, we saw about 18. 2015, we saw 10. We can kind of see a trend happening here, right? What has been happening to our honeybees um, in those 10 years there from 2005 to 2015? Their numbers have been going down, huh? And there's probably a few reasons this has happened. We'll kind of look at it. Some actually have um, declined so much that they're becoming endangered species. Um, there are actually 10 species of bumblebees on the endangered species list, which if we remember earlier, we had 45 species of bumblebees in the United States, which means that a quarter of all the bumblebees in the US are endangered. And even though we were looking at honeybee numbers, honeybees tend to do really well because they're farmed, right? So even if we see their numbers go down, we can kind of predict that bumblebees and solitary bees are kind of equally going down a little bit as well. So that's something we can be concerned about and looking into. But why is this happening? Why are we seeing bumblebee populations go down? If you have a quick thought, you can put it in the chat for me. Um, think about what you might have heard is going on, things that you've seen in your own area, what could be happening to affect our bumblebee populations and our honeybee populations. I 
Uh, some of us are saying, oh, that honeybees and things like that, they sting us, right? And sometimes that makes people kill them because they don't understand them or they're scared of them. Yeah, that's definitely a big one. There's some of us who are thinking um, that honeybees have a hard time finding homes or places to build their hives. Yeah, that's a big one too. Awesome. Have a lot of predators. Yeah, someone saying that they have um, things that will eat them and affect them. Absolutely. So all of those are true. A lot of the ones we think of have to do with things that humans do as well, right? Um, so especially, you know, if they're scared of them, they might kill them. Um, they don't want to be stung, right? So we might hurt them in that way. Um, but there's also things we do on kind of a bigger level. Uh, if we think about their habitats, the places where bees um, live, those places have to include areas to build their hives or places to find water, lots of flowers, right, to get their food. All of those different things are included in their habitat. And, you know, sometimes if we have to build um, something in an area um, and we have to take down a lot of the natural area to do that, that can be a problem for our bees. So they can lose out on some of those trees that they can build their homes in. There are also things we don't always think about, like pesticides, right? If we have these big farms, we've just talked about how important it is to have all these crops and um, apples and things like that, right? And sometimes we have to protect those crops from insects that are going to eat them all and destroy them all. But if we use a pesticide to kill those insects, we might also be hurting some of the good bugs as well, right? The bees, the butterflies that help pollinate them. And it kind of affects a lot of different things, but if we think about changing temperatures in the world too, right, as areas might get warmer, uh, even if there's some areas that are getting colder, a lot of those temperature changes can affect the time of year that flowers bloom, right? If it stops snowing in February or January as much and we have flowers blooming earlier, but the bumblebees aren't used to coming out at that time, then they can miss out on some flowers or miss out on some chances to get the flowers that they rely on. So that can be a big problem for them too. And I know sometimes this feels really big and scary, right? We're talking about all of these things that are happening. Um, and, you know, if we just talked about how important they are um, and these bees are disappearing because of these reasons, we also see that, you know, there might be less food, right? Uh, we talked about all those different kinds of food we get. And if we didn't have bees, we might not have some of those options. Now, there are some opportunities where humans can start pollinating as well. Um, people actually have taken little paintbrushes to transfer pollen between flowers. But as it turns out, we're just kind of not as good at pollinating as bees are. I would much rather eat that strawberry that was pollinated by a bee than um, a fruit that was pollinated by a human, right? Those are definitely not even comparable. The bee's much better at it. And if we think about people out in the fields having to pollinate, that means we have to hire people to do that and pay them, which means the price of our overall food will go up. So there's a lot of different factors to think about in that. And all of those things together, they feel kind of big, right? And I don't want you to walk away today feeling like that's too big and there's nothing you can do, right? There's always something you can do, even if it's just a little thing, right? So there's plenty of opportunities to get involved and help out our bees. Um, there are things that people do on a national level. So in our governments, whether they are the um, United States government or our local state governments, there are task force that help protect areas like national parks or even control things like pesticides. So there's things we can do on those levels. There's things that we do at our community levels, Butterfly Pavilion, helps um, senior centers and schools plant pollinator gardens, which means that not only do we plant really good nectar and pollen plants, um, but we plant really good trees and places for them to build their hives and give them good water sources. So we create whole areas that are really good for pollinators. And this is something that even on a smaller level, um, you could do with your own backyard, even if you just planted one little plant outside um, of your door, you could be helping a bee in this way too. 
And there are some things that relate more to science, right? There are lots of citizen science projects um, where people can volunteer their time and help scientists collect a lot of information about bees, right? One scientist trying to go out and find information on all of the bumblebees would never work. Uh, but one scientist getting lots of information from people around the United States about bumblebees can actually get somewhere. So there are projects like the Great Sunflower Project where people go out and literally watch a flower or a couple of flowers for an hour just to see what kinds of bees come to visit. There are apps where you can take pictures of the bees you see and help people understand where they are. There's Be Friendly, Be Smart. There's Bumblebee Watch, which is that same kind of thing. If you find a bumblebee, you can take a picture of it, upload it, and have an expert identify your species so we can verify where all of these different bumblebees are. All of these little dots across the map here are areas that people spotted bumblebees. And some of them you can see were verified in the green, and some of them are being worked on. Some of them maybe weren't, but that's okay. There's always going to be some data that kind of doesn't work as well. On top of collecting pictures and collecting data, you can also just build homes for bees. Lots of solitary bees will actually have homes and little crevices and areas around your home. So you can help them by, um, with the help of an adult, drilling holes into a piece of wood so they can build a nest in it. You can um, even take like an old soup can or something and put straws in it. And that's a great way for them to be able to build little homes in there. And if you're doing it as part of this program called The Bees Needs, they'll actually send you something that you can watch um, little solitary bees build their homes in. Um, you can hang it up somewhere and then actually observe the bees that um, start coming in and send that data into them. So it's another great way to tie into the data that helps our scientists. And, you know, the science and the data isn't for everybody. So even if you're just planting a garden or one potted plant outside your front door, um, that can be a great help to bees. You just always wanna make sure to check for pesticides, right? We don't want to make, use any pesticides or buy plants that have had pesticides used on them. So it's always a good idea to try to create pesticide-free zones when um, building these perfect gardens for bees. So hopefully, all of that helps you in some way realize that there's something you can do. And um, I even just installed a bee, little bee home outside my um, home and have started to see little bees join me there. So it's a great way to get to know some of them. And now that you know there's more than just honeybees and bumblebees, you can get to know a few of them a little bit more. Um, so that is pretty much all that I have for you today. Um, I know that we had some questions that came up through the whole time. Thank you for your patience. Um, in letting me get through the program so we can answer some of those at the end. Did we have um, some questions we wanted to cover? We sure did. And before we get to those questions, I do want to give students the opportunity for that Instagram selfie. So if we're ready to roll there, I'll give everyone just a moment to get their cameras at the ready. And I was just going to say, I think Kalei has our a part of our potential item to win uh, here in front of us to display. Uh, so as a quick reminder, if you tag us at Varsity Tutors and Butterfly Pavilion in your Instagram selfies, you'll have the opportunity to win that coloring book Kalei is showing off for us, as well as a wildlife creature camp enrollment. Now, as a reminder, that's part of our virtual summer camp series in which in this one week camp, students have the opportunity to learn about all sorts of wildlife from incredible insects to magnificent mammals to some pretty rad reptiles. They'll also get the chance to complete unplugged challenges, after camp challenges, and receive specialized content from our celebrity guest stars. So with that, I'm gonna give Kalei a moment to show off that coloring book and smile for the camera. Awesome. I know it seems kind of strange. We just talked about bees and there's our tarantula there, right? But it's a good reminder that Butterfly Pavilion likes to talk about all different kinds of invertebrates and tarantulas and bees are definitely going to have that in common. So Awesome. Thank you so much again. And absolutely a great reminder that even some of our, you know, some of our invertebrates that are known for being creepy and crawly and maybe potentially stinging uh, play a very important role in our ecosystem too. <laughs> so we had a lot of really, really awesome questions. So if you've got time, we might jump in with a couple yeah, of those. Uh, now, 
we had some students who it sounds like, you know, maybe potentially joined for lesson one when we were talking about those butterflies. Um, nice. We're wondering things like how long bees live and whether they whether they travel some of those great distances that we saw out of, I think it was the monarch butterfly. Um, can we talk, talk a little bit about the lifespan and the travels of these bees? Yeah, absolutely. There's, of course, a lot of different bees, so their lifespans are going to vary a little bit. And even in the same kind of bee, you may have heard of like a queen bee versus a worker bee. Some of those lifespans are going to vary. We, for honeybees or so, we say about a year, year and a half. Um, but there are going to be some variations to that depending on the type of um, even individual bee or the type of species. So that's important to keep in mind. Um, they also go through the same life cycle as butterflies. So if we remember that butterflies start as an egg to a larva, to a pupa, to an adult, bees are going to go through all those same stages. So there's going to be a few different sections of their life there. And then there aren't really any migrating bees that I know of. Um, so they're not going to travel quite the same distances as like a monarch. Um, but there are going to be some bees that travel big difference, distances just to get flowers and things. Um, they can travel a couple miles um, to and from their home um, just to get some flowers and nectar and pollen. So they can travel a little bit, but not quite like the butterflies we might see. Awesome. And for those of you who didn't get a chance to check it out, very, very highly recommend uh, heading on over to our YouTube page after today's lesson and taking a look at what we got to talk about around those butterflies in lesson one. Uh, now, we also had some, some pretty observant students who were thinking, all right, well, hey, you know, when I look around and I see bees outside, normally they're those kind of like black and like you said, yellow or orange bees. So is it that they're much more popular than some of those green and, and blue bees? Or perhaps are we having a harder time spotting that those bees that don't necessarily carry those colors we're used to are in fact bees? So I, we had a lot of questions around this. How can questions. we tell that yeah. it's a bee and not a fly? Uh, why, why are we even seeing so many of those less traditional bees? No, yeah, and there's definitely some element. Uh, honeybees are going to be pretty common just because they are farmed by people. So especially if you live near a beekeeper or within a few miles of a beekeeper, you're going to see some of those. But um, a lot of it does have to do with the fact that we don't recognize some of those solitary bees as bees, right? Um, so there are some bees that mimic as flies, so that way they can avoid um kind of being eaten maybe by things that wouldn't want to eat flies. And there's also flies that pretend to be bees. So that way they can stay away from them so they don't get stung. So there is a level of confusion there because sometimes you're not going to recognize a bee um, that you see just because it looks like a fly. It doesn't look like what you expect a bee to look like. So there are still a lot of those out there um, but yeah, it definitely is going to be a combination of those things where you just might not recognize the bees as well as the honeybees are going to be pretty common. Wow. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I guess if they're going to go ahead and look into some of those pro projects, definitely be on the lookout for some of those less traditional looking yeah. bees. There's a lot of resources out there that'll help identify bees and flies apart from each other. Some of them are really, really hard. You'd have to do a DNA test to do it, or you'd have to be a very... Um, a, an entomologist or a beekeeper who has spent years and years and years studying them, but there are some ways that you can tell them apart based on colors and patterns and eyes, even things like that. So, very cool. Now we also had some students who were wondering if you you guys at the Butterfly Pavilion collect honey from any of the bees that you have there with you, and whether you do or not, how people whether they're collecting honey or just out and about in their days can avoid getting stung by bees. Awesome question. Yeah, so we um, have kind of a smaller hive um, than some other places that actually raise um, bees. But this last year, we actually, for the first time, produced enough honey that we were able to bottle some and sell it. So that was very exciting. We do get um, honey. And even in the smaller hives, often honeybees produce way more honey than they can ever use. So to help them out, you can kind of take a little bit of it just to make their hives a little bit easier to maneuver. <coughs> um, but definitely we have a beekeeper who is on site and he has to go back and 
check on the hives. Even, even if he's not taking honey, he has to pull up those little sheets and make sure that everybody's healthy. So he will generally wear some pretty protective equipment. So if you've seen those big nets in front of people's faces and those big white outfits that cover their whole bodies, he avoids getting stung by just making sure he covers up. And then he'll actually use kind of a smoke. So if you've seen that as well, where people kind of put smoke around the bees, um, it kind of just makes them a little bit calmer and sleepier. So it's a little easier to manage them without them thinking that they're being attacked and trying to sting you while you're checking on them. Absolutely. Definitely making sure that we're being safe, not just for us, but for the bees as well. Exactly. Um, we have, I know we're running a little bit low on time. We had lots of really great questions around kind of what we'll say called bee superlatives. So like what's the biggest bee and the smallest bee and your favorite bee. So maybe we could speak just a little bit to some interesting bees that we didn't necessarily get a chance to talk about today. Ooh, that's good. So I think there's one that's pretty common that people talk about. I don't know a whole lot about it myself, but um, people will talk about mason bees um, because they are um, known for actually building um, pretty interesting nests. I believe they're a type of solitary bee. So it's kind of funny that they build an elaborate nest for just themselves, uh, but that might be one to check out. Um, otherwise, it would be awesome if you all maybe just did a little research and looked into the biggest bees and things like that. I don't even know some of those questions. So I think we all have some inspiration to look a little bit more into them. Um, I definitely think I don't know anything about them, but I love that like sweet bee that's like blue that I just talked about a little earlier. I never knew that bees could be blue before I worked here. So that's definitely one of my favorites to at least look at. And I'll probably have to do a little more research on them myself. Absolutely. Certainly always a lot more to learn there. And, you know, <laughs> students have taken a great first step in being here today and joining the class. Absolutely. So uh, it is about that time. Do you have any final closing thoughts for students before we round off today's class? Yeah, I just want to thank all of you for joining me today. It's so much fun to get to talk about um, bees and all of these different um, animals, um, not just the bees, but the invertebrates, tarantulas, butterflies. So if you ever want to learn more about those things, please check us out. Um, it's super exciting. Butterfly Pavilion has always been very passionate about pollinator conservation efforts. Um, so we do a lot of different projects and I would just in want to inspire all of you that if you really liked something we talked about today or there was one little project at the end there that you thought might be kind of interesting or fun to check out definitely look into it there are all kinds of resources for people to um, help collect more information about bees or help plant different flowers for them there's amazing resources out there to find good native pollinator plants as well. So um, always reach out to us if you have any questions about those, but um, we would love for you to join us in our pollination conservation efforts. That is so awesome. And we did have lots of other really great questions from students around what types of plants to plant where they're at and how to, how to go about making either a bee farm or a good kind of bee uh, habitat for the native bees in their area. And so certainly um, checking out what's gonna be local to your area and the best for the bees around you. Uh, it should put us in a great pot, spot to learn a little bit more about the specific bees around us, just like you introduced us to today. Uh, well, that's about it in terms of our time for today, but thank you so much once again to Calais and to the entire team at Butterfly Pavilion. Thank you guys for joining us and for asking such thoughtful questions. Definitely encourage you to check out even more with Butterfly Pavilion, as well as with that first class. And we hope to see you back in another Varsity Tutor Star course soon. And in the meantime, don't forget to post those selfies and tag us at Varsity Tutors, as well as the Butterfly Pavilion to win. Thanks so much, everybody.